This is As A Late Podcast. It's your boy Titus, and this is episode 95. We got Mercury Carter with us. What's going on, man? Hey. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining me, man. Thank you for having me. How you feeling? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Nice. Thanks for uh, joining me on this Saturday afternoon. Thank you. So how's your week been? Um, typical work week. You know, the capitalism, mm. the complaints. Got to make that money, man. Temps were a little warmer this week. That was nice. That was shockingly nice. Yeah. Yeah, that'll change though. Mm -hmm. um, um, nothing noteworthy. I was yours. Pretty well, man. Like you said, it was um good weather wise. Still on the work grind, of course. But all in all, it's, it was a good, good chill week, man. I can't complain. I can't mm -hmm. complain at all. You know, got to mentally prepare myself and you probably know this as well especially being a vocalist for this shift that we probably gonna get weather wise so i don't get sick yeah. <laughs> getting too used to these different like changes and but charlotte's always you know charlotte's always been like that it'll mm. be raining one day 40 at night <laughs> 60 yeah. the next day yeah so. it's definitely bipolar weather mm -hmm. how does that work for somebody like yourself who like who is a vocalist dealing with like the kind of changes of like the seasons that dramatically like that like what are some things that you do to like keep yourself prepared for that like especially in cases like this where like you got a show coming up the end of this month and stuff like that um everyone in my life knows i stay in the house mm. indoors strictly yeah gotta keep the voice protected <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm a legit recluse so that mm. seems to help do you think you would be like that in general even if you weren't like like an, an artist like yeah in the house to yeah it will probably be worse mm. if i wasn't forced to go out and network and connect with people mm. i legit would probably have vitamin d deficiency <laughs> 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 from how much i would stay in the house mm. why are y'all artists so why are some of the best artists so daggone recruits why y'all why y'all so hiding behind the scenes i don't know i don't know but once y'all get on the stage, y'all are, like, fucking monsters. <laughs> I know for me, I'm um, an extreme empath, so I tend to absorb a lot when I go out places, even if I go to the grocery store mm. and I'm interacting with the cashier. I can absorb some things within that transference. And also, I will say I'm more out during the warm months. Mm. because like plants i'm just i'm here for it but <laughs> when it's more so when it gets colder and the sun goes away i'm definitely more reclusive mm. um if i were to say anything i would want to model my career after adele's mm. i was completely here for that whole ideology of taking breaks for years at a time before she made it a thing so much so that was why I chose a different stage name than a real my real name. Because mm -hmm. at first I wanted to be anonymous on some Sia type stuff with her wig. Mm -hmm. AKA yeah. no one ever sees me, but that didn't last long. Yeah. Um, so I've always had an appreciation for alone time mm -hmm. or yeah. just not being consumed by too many eyeballs. But I don't think that'll last too much longer. Mm. That makes sense though, because like it, and I think it could last as much as you can afford it to last, you know, if that makes sense. Like, of course you got to do your thing and get out here, but I feel like Adele does a good job. Like you said, of like, when it's time to do the rollout, all right, I'm gonna show my face when it's time to fall back. I'm gonna fall back, but don't worry. I'm gonna sing about what I've been going through. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> she's gonna let you know everything that's been going on. And I kind of like it's kind of refreshing for me to see artists like that because you remember probably like I do. It was a time where, um, and I think probably streaming and like the 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 fall the the fall of like um like album really albums coming out I think caused that as well for industries to be like we got to push shit faster because like I I grew up at a time where you had like the Whitney's you had the Sade's that were of course they were we seen them on award shows but like they had like a Prince Sade they had that kind of mystique where you really wouldn't know what they were doing until like the album came out and mm -hmm. it was just like now it's a day of time where you got social media. You have like um, the Instagrams, the Twitters to where like if you're not popping, 
Like when I say popping, meaning like continually showing people shit, people think something wrong with you. Where yeah. you can really just be living your best life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in case to your point, it was back in the day that was the reason why you had people who will literally follow you on tour and go to different cities. Yeah. And people aren't motivated to do that no more because I can just look up the Atlanta dates on YouTube mm -hmm. and see what you did. Or really for any, I guess you would say, major city that you would have wanted to travel to back in the day. Like if my favorite was in New York, I would want to go see them in New York. And then mm -hmm. I would probably want to see them in LA or overseas too. Um, and like you said, just that that lack of accessibility because technology wasn't as advanced. You did have them on a saint-like pedestal because for most of the time you were wondering what are they doing. Yeah. You only saw them either on award shows or TV or at a concert. Yeah. It wasn't lives on instagram or tiktoks and mm -hmm. all that stuff now i love it like i loved when adele went live yeah um that was very interesting but she herself in an interview said she hated it so <laughs> it's, it's like you said it's a balance you have to learn how to play the game a little bit right mm -hmm. in this new day and age because it's like and like to adele's credit and me being a fan of it, it's dope to see her doing stuff like that because you don't get it that often. And so, like, when you, it'd be like, if Beyonce got on live, like, mm -hmm. cats would be, like, losing their fucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> like, what and the, the numbers would be crazy. The numbers Ultimately, it's a numbers <laughs> game at the end of the day. Automatically and a million. And team knows what they're doing. And, I, like you said, I feel like more artists should welcome that ideology because it'll make people desire you more. Yeah. Like, of course, artists are still successful in their own right, but you can look up interviews she's done, and they have over 20, 30, 40 milli views in less than 24 hours because people just are so interested because they're not used to seeing her. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think my biggest thing is, my biggest thing towards the reclusion is, Fighting against over exposure, yeah, and maintaining the reservoir of my own energy mm. because, <laughs> as people can probably hear in my voice, I was at a an event last night, <laughs> and today it sounds like I ate sand for breakfast. So <laughs> it's just it sounds that straight, type man. Of thing. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds fine. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know your voice. So it sounds fine. I wouldn't even know that unless you told me. But um, yeah, I think you gotta find that balance in and, and I completely agree with you. I feel like that's what I had to do because I felt like early on I was out like to the point where it's just like it got exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I had to I had to fall back. And I remember like I don't know if you ever got into like forty eight forty eight laws of power, like one of the things one of the laws was like, I'm paraphrasing it, but pretty much saying what you said is just like, fall back a little bit to like, let allow people to miss you. And so um, I started to do that. I was like, man, like, why am I really, I really studied why I was out so much. And it really because like, I was dealing with a lot of shit. I didn't want to be home by myself. And, you know, it's always some mental shit going mm -hmm. on. And so I once I unpacked that and was like, why am I really out? Am I really out for the purpose of, like serving people and like you know because like you being an artist like a lot of people don't understand that that's a that's a service like you you really pretty much giving people you're being used as a vessel mm -hmm. and like in servitude to an audience and that takes a lot of energy mm -hmm. and so like when you're talking about like even like as simple as going to the grocery store maintaining that energy is very key because like I've started to study that and realize that just like Dealing with, like, you know, I'll pray before I go in, in the gym, like, mm -hmm. and get my mind right. Because it's, like, that old saying, like, you can cut the tension with a knife, that shit is real. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're around certain people, certain energies, they'll try to attach themselves to you. And, like, it'll throw your whole energy off. So I feel like conserving that and knowing when to give it out and when to keep it back is very key. Mm -hmm. Very key. And I'm starting to realize that and learn that a lot. I did a lot of that. Even when stuff opened back up, I practiced that this year. 
And so mm-hmm. I think that's something I'm going to continue to carry. I was kind of forced into it. Like like you, when I was younger, I was definitely a multi-night person, but mm-hmm. I'm not even an executive week person at this point. If <laughs> I go out this week, next week, don't text me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was kind of forced into it because I've always had a tight circle. So the individuals that I would constantly hang out with were basically the same people over and over. Mm-hmm. And they all basically moved out of state. So I was left to my own devices, for lack of better terms, Mm -hmm. and was forced to enjoy my own company and slow down. And then also just growing up, like, to be quite honest, I slowed down at 21. Mm. I got drunk, of course. I turned it up, baby. And that was legit. I turned up the heat at 21. (laughs) That was like, this is it. No mas. I don't need any (laughs) more. And I haven't been the same since. So it definitely was something I had to lean into. And that actually happened before I tried to pursue music. Mm. That just happened, I guess, in the manner of just growing into adulthood. Mm. Um, But thankfully, I was just able to use that realization or what some may say in the mystic field, shadow work. Mm-hmm. for the sake of my career mm-hmm. and even work. Mm-hmm. So I work in healthcare, and that can also be very, very psychologically taxing. I can only imagine. Um, and thank God I'm not in the actual certified field. I'm in the administration part, mm-hmm. um, which I find to be worse because mm-hmm. you'll – that's the stories you'll hear. A lot of frustration in that phase. Yeah. Dealing I'm not in them. billing. I'm more so in the area where I have to figure out why a claim wasn't paid. And so sometimes I have to call the patient. Mm. And, you know, I guess quarantine and some in, because of their age and then some because their kids have moved out. They kind of use you on the phone as a vent session. So... It's really easy to hear lots of interesting stories. So that, and then in part with my career, and just trying to become more social for the sake of building an audience and connections Mm -hmm. and networking, it is very important. Uh, Yes. So (laughs) so much so I refuse to have a roommate. I can't. Dang, no room. You only child? No, but my sister is four years older than me. Okay. So, basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how I am. I mean, I, I actually got a lot of siblings, but I'm the youngest and wasn't expected to be born. And mm. so, like, like her twos were tied and it's a wrap. Like, she didn't. She, kind of the same for me. Yeah, she went to the doctor thinking, like, she was, like, sick. Like, had a tumor in her belly or something like that because she was like, yo, what is this growing in me? And she found out that it was me. And so with that, it's like a 10-year separation from me and the closest sibling because of that. And so I kind of, in a sense, of course, as we got older, we grew our relationship. Like, I'm roommates with one of my older brothers. He's, like, my best friend. But he is my best friend. But um, growing up, it was such a huge age gap that I pretty much was like the only child because mm-hmm. nobody was in the house. Mm-hmm. Like, even though he was like 10 years older than me, like he was out in these streets. Like mm-hmm. he was, he was like, he was 14, 15 doing whatever he was doing out there in the streets. And so the, and then he was the closest at age. And so these, the sisters, they were already in college and getting married mm-hmm. and all that. And so yeah. I pretty much kind of had that kind of mind state of like a black sheep only child at an early age. And kind of carried that on up until my adulthood. I think that's why in those 20s, I was so accessible. Mm. Because I didn't have nobody around to, um, I don't know, to to talk to or anything of that magnitude. But it was with the wrong people. If you mm. got a good group of people you can do that with, it's dope. But if you attach yourself to the wrong people, it can be horrible. Yeah, I've been blessed in that field. But from my intuition and also just from the sheer fact of, choosing the right people because Mm. tribe is one of my biggest things in life. And of course you've like everyone I've encountered individuals that weren't 
as honest as they portrayed themselves to be, but it was always something I kind of caught on from Jump Street, but mm-hmm. it was more so just giving a person the benefit of the doubt until proven guilty type situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you you escaped those people. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Got them out of my system. I don't regret it though because it you know it builds you up. It, it makes you realize, like Chris Rock had an old, he, not an old, it's kind of recent, like last year. He had a joke when he was talking about just the trials and, you know, just growing up as an adult and dealing with life. And he was like, God forbid you be 30 when you realize, like, niggas ain't shit. Where it's just like, mm-hmm. he was like, you know, like, I had bullies growing up. He was like, he was talking about his life. He was like, but I don't regret that because it showed me early in life, like, niggas is assholes. Mm-hmm. And like, it's some, it's some evil people out here. And so with that, like, I had enablers. I had, you know, just people just for the – the the season, you know, dealing with what I was dealing with at that time. And so I don't regret it because it showed me that. It showed me the good with the bad and knew how to be cautious moving forward. Mm-hmm. But I went through a lot of darkness in the sense of, like, not trusting people mm-hmm. and built a very hard shell. So I had to almost re, like, it dehumanized me to the point where I had to readjust to like being a human again if that makes sense like being yeah, friendly and you shit. Had to recalibrate yourself yeah and that's understandable i mean you low-key were going through ptsd yeah i still sometimes feel like a robot where it's just, <laughs> where it just be like certain crowds are like i find myself with that like even like i'll go to an event and listen to live music and like if if my homies ain't around or something like that, I won't talk to nobody. I'll just be in the back. Like, cats won't even know I'll be there. Yeah. And just, I'll strictly just be like, no, I'm just here for the music. Don't, I'll, all this extra crowd shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's the autopilot mm-hmm. that I call them. Yeah. But it's, it's a work in progress, you know. Every day. Um, but from what we've been discussing, we're better than what we were before. So that's all that matters. Yeah. At the end of the day. So let's get a little bit more into into you dealing with like I honestly I know you said don't ask me no like generic questions but I really don't know this shit. So, oh <laughs> so like like where like let's start like bo- birth wise like where were you born? Were you born here in Charlotte? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Presbyterian, Novant. I don't know. I CMC. Think, yeah, CMC. I think it was CMC. I baby. think my sister was Presbyterian. Okay. Okay, that's what's up. So, born and raised here in Charlotte. Was your family originally from this this state? Like, my mom is from Gaffney, South Carolina, and my dad is from Winston. Okay, so Carolina baby in general comes from. Yeah, um, same like me. My mother is from the outskirts of Wilmington, and then they traveled here. My dad was originally from Belmont. Mm. Is originally from Belmont. He's still living, but yeah, Carolina baby myself. Mm-hmm. And so, apparently, we're rare. Yeah, but it's a lot of us out here. We only I get I used to get that all the time when I would be out and talking to people and they'd be like, Oh man, it's like especially when I get in lifts. Mm-hmm. Like they'll be like, Oh, you're born and raised here? Like, mm-hmm. dang, you're like an albino kid. And yeah. I'll be like, All my friends are born and raised from Charlotte. Like a lot And it's just like you're proving our point as to why there's so much inflation. All of them <laughs> go back home. All of them <laughs> go back home. Except for you, KB. You cool, man. Yeah, you can stay. Anyone pre DNC for Obama needs to go back home because that's when <laughs> stuff got cray cray. <laughs> yeah, man. So you've like me. You've like me. Seen this growth in Charlotte and seen uh, absolutely what it's become. Like, absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? Just like it's nauseating. <laughs> <laughs> It is. I'm just like, wow, I might as well move to a major city for real, for real. I've been thinking that, too. Like, we were talking about this. We were just like, sometimes I still be like, man, I need to just hit New York. But the cost is so stupid up Um, there, bro. It's about to not be no different. Oh, my goodness. It's legit about to be no different. The way cost of living ratio is down here is about to be no different. Mm. You can't afford crap anymore in charlotte Mm. if you live alone and you make below 20 bucks an hour Mm. period you have to have a roommate or you have to have 84 side hustles and that's ridiculous because we're not even the capital of north carolina yeah 
which I think needs to change at this point. I Sorry, agree. Sorry, Raleigh. Mm-hmm. Gotta go. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. I've been saying that. I agree. So, yeah. It, I, the only thing that keeps me from New York is just the sheer volume of people. Mm. It's a lot of people. And the living conditions. Mm-hmm. I can't pay two grand a month and my place got rats. Yeah. My brain just can't compute that. Mm. When I can at least come back to Charlotte. And at this point, with inflation, live in Hidden Valley for two grand a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it'd probably be a, it'd be a house. Yeah. And it'd be just you. Yeah. As opposed, as opposed to paying two grand in the city. And it's probably the space is like this size, maybe. Not even. And you're sharing a bathroom, probably. This is the living room. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. I might, you know, in Hidden Valley, I might have 4th of July every night, but mm. it's much better than, you know, potentially waking up to a mouse on my pillow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had enough traumas with that, with freaking spiders down south. Mm. I don't need that with mammals <laughs> in New York City. I just don't. Yeah, that's a whole nother world up there, man. And so I think I'll get to the point now to where, I, like we talked about, I'll probably just visit more often than I've been yeah. doing. You know, have seasons where I'll go for like a summer. Yeah, extended stays, but mm-hmm. not moving. Yeah. Yeah. I want to experiment the same with L.A., but I feel like I would just spend my whole trip in traffic. Mm. It's a lot of traffic out there. Right here. It's, it's ridiculous. But once you get past that, man, like the dude that I interviewed last week, he's out there now. And so that's a good connection that I have that I can check up on when I, whenever I do decide to get there. But aside from the traffic and probably, you know, some of the stuff that he was talking about dealing with, like territorial, like gang stuff that he had to, you know, he had to get that out of the way. But L.A. is where, I mean, it's a lot, If especially with somebody like myself that's trying to deal with in- entertainment, I'm going to have to hit. One of those markets. So Both of them. Yeah. To be quite honest, you have mm-hmm. to cover it. One is west and one is east. Yeah. You legit got to hit both because mm-hmm. they're honestly completely different audiences, different mm-hmm. types of money, different types of everything. If, well, if, as far as music goes, I can't speak for the entertainment business. Mm-hmm. I absolutely, probably the same. I'm saying. Absolutely, we'll go to New York more so for bookings, but we'll go to LA to actually work on music. Mm, yeah. I could see that, which a lot of people do. Yeah. Like, they, they go through the whole, like, media run and, and hustle and bustle of the industry. As you see, like, some of the, if not 95% of the major outlets is in New York. So mm-hmm. they go through that whole hustle and bustle. But then when they're creating the actual process of it, most of them are in L.A. Or mm-hmm. they're somewhere remote, like in the mountains somewhere or some shit. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with what you were saying in the beginning, the the energy of that city mm-hmm. and the feeling you get in certain environments gives you that that creativity. Like, I think that's why a lot of them go to, like, Cali to do that and create. And create in terms with you, like, how do you set, like, like when you're creating, like, a project, how do you set the tone? Like, what are some things that need to be, like, in the room, you know, some people have candles lit or some people like get themselves in a good mental space. Like what are some things that you do for yourself before you, you know, you, you start your creative process? <sighs> <laughs> mm, this is going to be a very interesting answer. All right. I'm okay. here for it. First of all, I don't really have much experience with having to create a space. I don't have any features. I've never been featured on anyone's, um, project or song. Well, that's going to change. <laughs> um, I've never, except for once, I've never really even recorded in a studio space. That's also going to change. <laughs> my original debut EP was done in my room, all of it, on my iPad, on in a Poji or a Pofi, I forgot how to pronounce it, microphone that I had bought that you can plug directly into a iPad or an iPhone mm. pre pre before them changing those freaking ports. After mm. they did that, that whole swoop D just got screwed up for me. Mm. But before when it was literally just to charge your phone, you could plug a microphone into it 
And you could have used it for podcast or to have clearer sound on videos you posted, mm. on your stories, or to record music. Mm. And I literally did that. And you can listen. The most of the actual instrumentation is not very melodic. And it's because I don't know how to play shit. So <laughs> I was just basically playing Knickerbocker on my iPad mm. with beats. And that whole process was being drunk over a horrible breakup, high out on mine on weed. Mm. Um, I want to say slight eating disorder also. And, of course, chronic depression. Mm. And my other project, the only other project that I have out is a jazz covers um, EP. And that was actually <laughs> more chaotic. It was mm. a marathon. So much so <laughs> I had to do it all in one day within eight hours. Really? So Damn. all of that is literally me doing stuff in one take and getting the fuck out of Dodge. So you recorded all of that project in eight hours? Yeah, I had to for budget purposes. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's fucking crazy. Remember, I didn't even know it was covers. I thought that was you. I was like, who wrote this? You was like, nigga, this is... <laughs> this this is fool thought I, I wrote a queen song. Uh, I was like, okay. I was like, dang. I'm honored. Because y'all changed A. I don't listen to Queen like that. No, and it was so the, the Dale joint. Oh, it was the okay. Daydreamer song you thought I wrote. Okay. Yeah, from her 19 album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my it's pen. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't even know if I'm a good songwriter. The EP was all self-written, but it was more so just a collection of poems. But as far as like writing an actual A-B style song or mm -hmm. trying to make a hit, Mm -hmm. Or get on the radio. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's in my contract by really? God because I'm more focused on how I sound. Mm. So I feel like I'm more of a Whitney type of girl. Give me the know? give me the words and I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it. Yeah, versus me sitting at home trying to write a song, but. Mm. I also feel like if I was more so in a realm that Mariah was in where she had access to musicians that she can just chill with, I feel like in those types of moments, I'll probably write some shit. Mm -hmm. But like you said, with Black Sheep, that's how I feel about the music scene here. Mm -hmm. um, I've yet to be fortunate enough to not only meet enough musicians, but craft a relationship with one to be able to do that. Just hit up like maybe I'm got lit at brunch and I'm feeling spontaneous and I can like text you to come over and we just jam out for a moment and then a fucking song might come into fruition mm -hmm. and it might just be with a acoustic guitarist or a pianist and then that song could grow into something different yeah but even that I've yet to experience so mm -hmm. unfortunately up till now my I'm practices have been quite toxic. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say my practices for a live performing is way different. That is more so what I've streamlined most of my career towards mm. versus actual recording or content work. Um how would you explain your process with that? Like the like you got well, some coming up. Shout out to Tiffany Tiffany Moore Borgelin. She's my voice coach, and she is the individual that helped me craft more so like a, um, I don't want to say, um, oh, God, what is the word? Um, what is the thing you do over and over again before you do something like? I don't like some people might, might might meditate, some might pray. Ritual. What's the word you call? Yeah, yeah, like a pre-show ritual. Mm. She helped me establish one, where it is first of all you're completely silent the whole day, mm. unless a sound check, um, and your stomach is full, so you're not lacking, and you're focused. So most days I don't really interact with anyone. Um, well, most most days that I'm performing, I should say, I don't really interact with anyone. Mm -hmm. I'm 
more so headphones are glued on my ears the whole day. Mm. Either I'm listening to the set list or I'm watching my faves do live performances to help quote unquote trauma bond because I'm like, girl, I know you're on stage shitting on yourself right now. <laughs> so you know how I feel. So it's like, it's like therapeutic to watch someone else maneuver through what you know they're currently going through. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Like, I always, I think that's why I respect artists that especially are so good performing live because like we're all humans here. We're all going through that. Like whoever, whoever says like, yeah, I was just born like dominating the stage. You're fucking lying because yeah. like everybody has those nerves. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody is like, everyone oh, how do was I humble sound? at least. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if you're not humble, then that's when you lose it. You lose the nerves or you lose the um, the the stage fright. I have horrible stage fright. Mm. If you saw me backstage, you crazy, will roast dude. me for the rest of my life. <laughs> I haven't gotten to the point where I vomit, but it's to, I, I'm like literally shivering like I have hypothermia. Wow. Up until I walk into the stop, the, the, the spotlight, and then it just stops. Wow, that's crazy. But then it continue, It happens again when I'm walking off, and probably until I get home in the bed, and it just slowly fades away. But I'm, of course, that's just adrenaline, mm. but it feels... All I'm, this is what it feels like. Imagine red and blue lights behind you. Mm. That's what it feels like. Mm. Non-stop. <laughs> Any contact back here, boy? Oh, shit, nigga, the motherfucking police. Here, take this nigga, put this, put the, on the, put the gun in the fucking hey, seat. One time, nigga, get up, put that motherfucker up. Put the, open the window. Put the window. Non stop. Oh my non god. Stop. You you paranoid as a motherfucker. That's the case. piss and shit on myself Good until grief. I walk on stage. Legit. Wow. Yeah. But then it's it's crazy because it's like like you said, the the humble ones, like they'll tell you that. And then that's why I respect it even more because it's like you'll you'll know that and then something clicks to where it's just like, okay, I gotta dominate. Where it's just like yeah. that fear drives them to where, like Mike Tyson said that in the sense of like boxing wise, he was like, he said, when I'm going to the ring, he said, I'm scared as shit. He was like, I'm scared as a motherfucker. He said, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. He said, but by the time I get inside the ring, he said, I'm a monster. He was like, I, I think I'm a god when I get in the ring. He's like, because like that fear drove me to the point to where it's like, I got to do this right. And mm -hmm. so it was just like, I feel like that's the same with artists. Like you have that fear and then something to click to where it's like, um, what is it? Um, fight or fright type shit mm -hmm. to where fight it's just like, flight, yeah. I got to do my thing, man. I got to show these people why, what I'm good at. Yep. And the drive for you to want to be so good at it will get you through that whole process. Yeah. And just not for me. I, I, I completely concur with what he said. That definitely goes into play. I think in in shit. I'm sure with him it is fear because he don't want to get his fucking nose broke. That's one but of the things he me, said. He said I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want my nose. You like yeah, because you can die from boxing. Yeah, that 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 type of head trauma is the exact same as football. Oh yeah, and. I'm sure that type of fear comes from a different place. Mine, well, no, because it's still a physical fuck up. Mm -hmm. Because for me, of course, you don't want to lose key or forget the lyrics mm -hmm. or lose a cue. So that's where some of mine comes from, just not embar embarrassing myself. That was one of his as well. And my a fucking parents in the audience. A thousand things, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think the most is not wanting to betray this creative force that I've been blessed with mm. for my own selfish devices, AKA anxieties and mm. fears and imposter syndrome, which is another thing in my smorgasbord menagerie melting pot of things. But ultimately it's not, Wanting to betray that creative force because I feel like if you do it enough, it'll leave. Mm. Before you know it, I'll sound like Billie Holiday. And it worked for her, yeah. but it won't for me. Mm. I will be forced to work in healthcare for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, and then just, like he said, the sheer fact of wanting to do good and not 
mess up. Mm. But like you said, when you get in to the ring, for lack of better terms, yeah, I, I to this day I couldn't tell you what I do on stage. I just I just zone out. It's almost like the conscious mind that does activate fears and anxieties. It cuts off. Yeah, and the subconscious that possesses the creative force kicks in. Mm. Like I'm I. You, you might as well say I was in a fever dream. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that also contributes to why I don't like watching myself <laughs> because it's like, uh, no, yeah. no, no, I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely am here for maintaining my stage fright for as long as possible. I welcome it. Yeah, I used to hate that that I had it to the point to where it was like. Because I felt like, and, and then I wouldn't talk to people that performed at that time because I just felt like, man, I got to get bold. I got to get it right. Like, you know, the greats don't do that. But then when I realized the greats go through that as well, and then even people in the city like yourself, like people that I fuck with that I admire their work, they all go through it and we're all humans. I was like, all right, so this isn't nothing. This isn't, um, what's the word it's I'm looking not for? not out of the norm. Yeah, it's not out of the norm to feel like that just because you got a certain gift and you want to share it. It's not, you ain't supposed to like have this given to be like, I'm supposed to have the confidence to do it as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, once I realized that, I was like, okay, well, I can I can do this as well because this guy's shyer than me, but he's getting through this process. And so that helped me seeing that to where it was just like, and preparation. Mm-hmm. Practice is key as well. Yeah, Rehearsal being is key. Confident in yourself. Yeah. I yeah. see a lot of the greats. That's one thing that I studied as well. They get to those points because they go through rehearsal. I they go love through rehearsals. practice. They go through, like you said, getting vocal. They're going through this whole process. So by the time they get on that stage, it's it's routine for them. Mm-hmm. And so I love it. For yeah. me, that rehearsing is like um, fit or CrossFit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a firm believer in there's never too much rehearsal. I agree. Now, granted, I'm not going to do like eight or nine rehearsals the week of a show. Yeah. But if I know months in advance, I don't think 10 or 12 rehearsals is a stretch. Mm. Now, apparently I'm on crack cocaine because (laughs) the norm is a three or maybe two. Damn. Or possibly one. Um, But, yeah... It, I've, I've always loved rehearsals, and like you, I definitely sought gratification in my stage fright through the people I idolized. I listened to um, an audio book of Ella Fitzgerald's biography, and her manager said, well, wrote, well, was quoted saying that after every single performance, she would ask him, did I sound okay? Mm. To still have that humility, and I need y'all to understand, this woman only took four weeks off during the year. (laughs) That's crazy. For 50 plus years consecutively because that's how much she loved to work. Mm. So for you, after all that time, to still think, Mm. is that okay? Is that fine? That's crazy. And of course, it's, a, an honest question because she would only ask him mm-hmm. and he literally was the only person that crafted her career and crafted her sound wow. and helped cultivate her into this silky smooth voice that we all know. Mm. So it's just stuff, research like that, like you said, has helped me cope with it too. Word. You talk about Ella Fitzgerald. Um, that brings me to the next question of you. Um, being an artist, being a fan of that particular genre as well. Extreme, you don't put me on people on it, that particular jazz genre. Who are some of the people that you grew up listening to? Like, we, we already know Ella, but like. Sarah Vaughn. Um, I didn't really dive deep into jazz until middle school when I went to Northwest. When I was younger, it was more so just when my parents played around the house and what I was exposed to as a child. Most of us was like that. So to be quite honest, 
like during the the aircrafting years, like pre twelve years old, definitely was on the Destiny's Child, the NSYNC, oh, the okay. Britney Spears, the Christina Aguilera's, Pop Air, Blue Man Group, absolutely, <laughs> Disney Channel's radio station. Mm. You, you remember that radio mug. Disney, bro? What? <laughs> definitely was a ninety five point one person. Um, Beyonce, you know, I my, my I was definitely a pop child, mm. but my parents exposed me to a lot of amazing music. So they mm. around the house will play everyone from Quincy Jones to the Funkadelics mm. to the Beatles to, of course, gospel. I mean. This time year the year it was nothing near Kurt Franklin's gospel album, mm. but I didn't dive into actual music music catalogs myself until I was exposed to opera by way of piano class in middle school at Northwest, mm. and that was discovering Natalie Desse, and that kind of opened my realm of opera, and that's when I. Tried to start singing around the house to myself. Mm -hmm. And then through that, I would discover jazz. And through that, I would discover basically everything I know now from Imogen Heap to Sia to mm. the XX to Little Dragon. I love the XX. To... Ella, Sarah, Mahalia Jackson. I love George Benson. He's an amazing jazz vocalist. Of course, mm. Donny Hathaway. Some contemporaries I love is his daughter, Layla. Mm. Um, I love Cecile Salvant, McLaurin, Jasmia um, Horn, Samara Joy. I mean, the list goes on as far as jazz artists that I love. But when I was younger... The first person I discovered was Ella, and I probably listened to her only for a good four or five years before mm. I branched out, for lack of better terms. To other genres. And yeah, um, that was definitely the LimeWire era also, mm. so it wasn't the whole... What a time to be alive. YouTube suggestion <laughs> box where it's easy to go down a rabbit hole, you know? Yeah, it really that is nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so I was really left to my own devices, mm. and most of that stuff wasn't even... On stuff like LimeWire and streaming platforms. Yeah, that's true. Because they, it had to come from somebody putting it on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's back in the day, back in the day, LimeWire. I used to burn all my city, CDs through that and then sell them and <sighs> to, to like high school students. The people <laughs> on the school bus used to hate me because I used to have that stuff bumping. <laughs> bumping at 6 a.m. in the morning. Oh, I don't care man. if y'all finna hear this Evanescence. Okay? <laughs> Break me out. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Love great it. great um, vocalist, though. She's a beast. Love her. Mm -hmm. That that showed me, that was like the perfect combination back in the day because I had never, and I feel like the industry had as well, like, I had never at that time seen somebody mesh those together. Those two and genres. that's why they were such an instant success. Yeah. Now, of course, now it's everywhere. Everywhere, right? But Amy, oh, she taught all the girls. Yeah. She taught all the girls. I don't think she gets talked about enough in that sense. Bring me to it? life completely. I don't even think... I don't even think back when rock was experimental in the 70s, no one did stuff like that. Nah, dog. Not with that kind of voice. Mm -mm. Not bound, not meshing those together. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Not a female. Nope. Nah, not off the top of my head. I can't think of nobody. And that really, like you said, it, it set a trend for that to where you started having a lot more female vocalists do that. And get with certain bands and try to mesh that together. Mm -hmm. Even today, like um, I would, I would consider like an influence that she would probably admit um, is Halsey. Like Halsey does that sometimes with her work. Mm. Like she mixes in that great combination of like rock with like her kind of because she has a decent voice to where like she's she gets it how she can mesh it together. I feel like she was a big influence on people like her. Uh, Haley, the dude, um, not the dude, the chick from Param Paramore. Yeah, I feel like that she was the first her. person that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't listen. I don't. I've never listened to Halsey's or Hall Hall 
Halsey. Halsey. Mm-hmm. I saw her movie on HBO Max. I didn't even know the she had a movie. She released for her album. I she, need to watch it. I ain't watch it. Basically, it's one of those long music video type things. For oh, her okay. Album. Yeah, I may not watch it then. I like documentaries. I, I, I'm a sucker for documentaries. It's very so. visually striking. Mm. Um, and I still am confused as to how they made her not look pregnant. Mm. Highly suggested, but it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, I've never delved into her catalog, so I I, I can't say I know what she sounds like. But definitely Haley from Paramore, and shit, even softer rock type people like the XX or um, I'm drawing a blank because I'm currently famished from. Any types of nutrients, but <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot out there, definitely. But mm. definitely, Haley from Paramore. Yeah, that's a fact. When did um, because we hear the influence and the inspirations that you're saying that you grew up with. When did you yourself decide, or even had a glimpse of like a cosign? When I say cosign, somebody hearing you sing and you realizing like. Okay, I feel like this is I can do this. Like you know that Ella Fitzgerald, like you said, like her talking to her manager and being like, "How did that sound?" When was that first moment for you when you was like, "How did that sound?" And somebody was like, "You sound great." To to give you that confidence to you know do what you're doing now. I have two answers to that question. The first time someone actually told me that I had a voice. And kind of like put into my parents' head that he could potentially do something was I forgot his real name. And when my, when my parents hear this, they'll probably send this to him. He's going to reach out to me. <laughs> but I remember his name was Deacon Mac. And Deacon Mac? Yeah. And he basically. My parents made me audition. Well, not audition. But they made me join the children's choir. And he was the first person that really was like, oh, hmm, so much so I was giving solos and shit. Mm. But I signed a trash shampoo criminal. <laughs> I sounded awful, okay? Um, I don't know what he was hearing, but he heard something. I was definitely I hear not something, like... Bro. Your Whitney or your Shaka that was given throat at 12. Mm. There's an album of Aretha on Apple Music, a gospel album that she did when she was 12. Ridiculous. <laughs> Titus and KB, I'm not playing with you. At 12? After this, I'm going to play a smidge of one song. You can't tell me she don't sound 30. <laughs> Damn. That's and true. this is when she first started smoking So it's like Start smoking? Nigga, yeah, you know but back then Nigga was fucking and smoking at 10 Yeah, that's true And I don't want to get her tea But I mean she was pregnant at 13 I never watched that I, I didn't watch that biopic So well, I, I really don't Every fucking book about her Because never read it. it's so obvious mm -hmm. If you look her up her child's Her children, her son's ages and hers mm. Um, But anyways I was definitely not a prodigy with voice like mm. her and others. Okay. But to answer your question for real, for real, I wasn't told that in a manner that made me want to pursue music Early until on. 2015 by my two of my best friends because everyone that rests me in the car knows I will give you a full Alone concert. concert in the car <laughs> because of driving anxiety. Mm. I cannot drive this 3,000 pound automobile without fixing a shit on myself unless <laughs> I'm listening to music and oh singing at the top of my lungs. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I would always do that, you know, back then with smoke and drive, hot box, all the things, be in the car tweaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they would get the best of the best, <laughs> for lack of better terms. Oh and they goodness. was like, you should do an EP. Like, they probably cursed me from 2014 
until October of 15 when I did the EP. Mm. And they their timing was on point because that same month I was in a horrible breakup. And so I did the EP in one week and mm. sent it to them. And it was like, release it. Mm. Just release it. And the rest is history. And their names are Brandy Thomas and Chelsea Charles. They're Shout out to they them. Are. Shout out to good friends. Yeah, I'm going on almost two decades now. Mm. I sure to find two decades of friendship. Maybe I got maybe like two. Yeah, yeah. same here. This mm. definitely one end. Mm. Definitely. Yeah, because a lot of people get weeded out, go through life, and then some. Some people, not even necessarily, you know, bad terms. It's just just grow apart. You exactly. Know? I was gonna say you just outgrow each other, mm-hmm. or um, it just fades. Yeah. So what's closing out this interview? We're getting into pretty much going into because we're in the fourth quarter, going into twenty twenty two. We know you got the show coming up. December 19th, I believe. Mm-hmm. December the 19th. What can people expect from not just the show, but from Mercury coming into 2022? We getting the new release going on? Cause I'm no I'm, new release unless there's an amazing investor listening to this that wants to. I got to stack my money up then. I need to invest. <laughs> into the starving artist. Investors. Investors. Wh- wherever my camera is. Yeah. Mercury um, Carter. Cause I'm not a digital babe. I need full live instrumentation in the studio, and that is coinage. Um, so you do want to make a project? Yeah, you just want the full. I need as, as, want as you to should rightfully so. Every piece of stagnancy in my life with my career that does not deal with me being stagnant on the west wing of the fucking stage because of stage fright. Mm-hmm. It's because of lack of finances. Mm. And it's because it's expensive being an artist, especially when you don't have any representation or no consistent means of bookings. Mm. You are literally, your nine to five is meant to sustain your well being and your creative endeavors. Yeah. And so, yeah, I can't really say there might be a, a new release next year, but. I feel what people can expect from not only the show, but also me as a whole is um, more relaxability. I think before quarantine and before the, um, the, the sitting that I had to do during it and the sheer images I was exposed to through the duration... I kind of found myself this year when things opened up and I was able to practice these realizations instead of just sitting in my room watching Netflix all fucking day. (laughs) (laughs) I realized I was more prone to being relaxed versus than what I was before. Um, Before, like we said, wasn't really out places. If I was at a performance... I was vintage designer down to my socks. You do be and you dripped out here touch now. me. <laughs> um, would never have caught. Like, bruh, just, just to sum that whole sentiment up, before this year, you would have never caught me with a snapback on. Fucking up my hair for a hat. Mm. You Go know, judge your mama. You know, that's why I really didn't know that was you. Sneakers, <laughs> all of this. Sneakers, jeans, Converse, never. If this was, if this happened this time in 2019, I would have came in here with a Gucci suit on. <laughs> and a fresh twist out. Woo. I swear to God. But now it's like. You, mm, you balance it out. You mix it up a bit. I was like, mm, you're going to get these Levi's in this sweater. Yeah, it's good to balance it out a bit. Man. And I feel like that's carrying over into my music um, and how I am on myself when it comes to the things I do. Like before, if I did one note wrong in the concert, I would not want to perform for a whole six months and would not. Mm. Would get bookings, but would say no because I was just that hard on myself. But now it's like, bitch, fuck it. Yeah. I mean, if anything, that was emotion 
or at max, no one is going to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, so just that type of relaxation is what I'm pushing to exude through not only myself, but my work, but. I mean, I'm not saying niggas gonna catch me on stage in a Adidas tracksuit. <laughs> no. I'm definitely never gonna be on that Khalid shit, you know, mm-hmm. performing in a Canadian tuxedo. But <laughs> more so in the things that take place outside of that, where I have to put on the mask, that is feeding into the person that has to wear that mask. Mm. So basically, I wanna be more relaxed in real life because. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Mercury Carter is a facade, if you did not know. Mm, facts. Yeah, that's dope, man. That's dope. Who's winning the voice? Wendy? <laughs> Wendy better fucking win the voice. <laughs> Bro, don't do this. You know I had to close out with that. I already know. Look, if, not if, when I make it and this shit is still on YouTube and the girls pull this up and try to cancel me, suck my dick. <laughs> Wendy needs to fucking win. Everyone else kick rocks. Joshua oh my kick rocks. I ain't even gonna get Jim into Joshua Sasha, right now. You be on Joshua rocks. head, boy. Haley kick <laughs> rocks. <laughs> Who else? Paris, love you, bro. I'm sure Lucas dog. is smiling. Kick fucking rocks. <laughs> Wendy needs this. Wendy deserves it. Oh and she better gosh. get it. Wendy Period. need this bad, bro. I will go get 45 Twitter bug goddamn phones just to <laughs> fucking vote for her ass <laughs> from different phone numbers because it's no longer a game. Wendy needs to win. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to close it out on there. I ain't going to get you. You ready to up too much more. <laughs> yeah, because it'll be a whole other fucking episode. Oh, my goodness. Mercury, man. I thank you for coming, man. This has been a great episode. This is As of Late.